she's going to talk about a couple of studies uh, that she's working on, the neural networks of spasmodium and another study, the treatment of SPD with power. Dr. Christina Simonian. Thank you very much um, for inviting me to speak uh, at the FSDA meeting. Last time was, I believe, a few years ago in Chicago. It's always great to come back and see familiar faces, meet new people. And talking about this, I just want to take some time and thank everyone who came from all over the country and uh, darker shaded areas or states are the ones that people came from and participated in the studies in New York and now in Boston. If you identify your state, which is in lighter shade, please uh, come and participate. <laughs> <laughs> we want to get to all 50 states. Um, we have people even from Alaska and Hawaii joining and uh, so far we had 690 participants across different studies from 2008 to today. And uh, these are not only patients with SD, but these are their parents, their children, brothers, sisters, cousins, nephews, nieces. So it's take more than a village across 45 states to tackle uh, what's happening uh, with this uh, disorder in terms of brain uh, changes and how brain uh, is responsible for your voice. We have also international participants from Canada and England, Ireland, and we have also very special participants who think of us even at their, uh, the very last moment of their lives, such as uh, Richard Stewart, and we're very thankful to Richard and Rose and Elizabeth who um, contacted us at the very last moment and requested that we um, continue with the brain donation from um, Richard and now we have his brain, his blood, his um, imaging, multimodal imaging and we're going to put all this together and combine with other post-mortem tissue from other patients and move on with uh, some of neuropathological studies that we have been doing in spasmodic dysonia. So thank you very much, Ruth. I also couldn't have done all that without my wonderful lab, all the past and present uh, members of the lab, as well as a number of my collaborators. At Mass here, Dr. Song is there in the back, Dr. Azilis is over here, she already gave a talk. Uh, my uh, collaborators uh, in New York, I still work with them, as well as uh, uh, international um, collaborators from uh, Germany, from uh, England, from Ireland. Uh, as well as the funding, we had generous funding from National Institutes of Health that allowed all of these studies over these years. So, um, this all uh, resulted in a number of papers, uh, exactly we published today, 36 papers only on SD. And they, they span through um, identifying different aspects of pathophysiology of spasmodic dysphonia, including its uh, brain function, structure, neurotransmission, such as uh, uh, dopaminergic and GABAergic uh, function, Brain pathology, as I just mentioned, we have a collection, probably the largest collection of postmortem brains in the one lab uh, from patients with spasmodic dysphonia. 
Uh, we used all this information to look into neural markers uh, that I will talk a little bit later about. We have been collaborating with Dr. Azilis on genetics, as she mentioned, and we're moving towards objective diagnosis and novel treatment options for all of you. So, um, uh, given our research meeting yesterday, I thought I will include uh, some slides about our novel ways of diagnosis, uh, uh, of diagnosing dystonia and spasmodic dystonia in particular. So, um, there are a few facts that um, are important to realize. We do not know the causative um, you know, factors that play role in the uh, development of symptoms, in clinical manifestation of symptoms. We also do not know the exact pathophysiology. Uh, while we understand how brain may function or not function in some regions uh, for symptom development, we still do not understand what it causes. Uh, there is a um, very, uh, the consensus between physicians, laryngologists, neurologists, speech language pathologists is very hard to achieve because there are no specific measures and basically it is based on the experience of treating physician or speech language pathologists, um, uh, so experience in knowing the disorder, um, being appropriately trained and so on. So patients with remote locations, uh, have, uh, who have um, uh, um, not so great access to larger clinical centers where ST patients are seen have harder time getting correct diagnosis in time. And this uh, uh, results in the estimated delay between the symptom onset and uh, the first diagnosis, first accurate diagnosis uh, for about uh, five years, uh, which is quite a long time given that we use our voice on a daily basis and it brings a lot of frustration to, to all of us if we are not able to communicate. So uh, the question is, can we uh, use any of our current knowledge uh, to build new objective uh, and fast and timely diagnostic markers of this disorder? I'm not trying to put physicians out of business. I'm trying to help uh, um, in speeding up with the diagnosis, uh, giving them some tools that they can use together with their expertise in, um, for developing new, uh, faster and accurate diagnos diagnostic procedures. So, um, as a step one, um, we need to look into brain function in spasmodic dysphonia. And uh, this was a work of my former postdoc, Giovanni Battistella, who is now at UCSF. Uh, where we um, recruited a number of uh, patients with different forms of uh, spasmodic dysphonia, including a doctor and a doctor, as you can see in these um, groups. Um, we also separate them into so-called sporadic and familial cases, with familial meaning that they had the report of um, history of uh, dystonia or spasmodic dysphonia or both in their families and sporadic patients were classified by gender history of having no dystonia uh, whatsoever um, in their family. So these were groups of about 30 uh, people um, and they were compared to each other as well as to group of healthy controls that were matched by age and gender and handedness and, so and genetic status and so on. So uh, we use so-called resting state functional MRI. So what it means is that although your symptoms appear during speaking, uh, the brain pathways are inherently um, abnormal that support the uh, abnormal output of your speech. So uh, resting state functional MRI is a very powerful uh, methodology because it's relatively short scanning sequence, um, therefore it can be easily translated into clinical practice. And uh, all what you do in the scanner, you just lie down and we ask you not to think of anything in particular and not to fall asleep. Otherwise we will be measuring your dreams rather than your uh, <laughs> uh, brain connectivity during uh, speaking. So um, it is uh, based on um, evaluation of interactions between different brain regions um, and uh, several studies have reported uh, and replicated uh, the findings of different uh, um, uh, 
uh, brain pathways, functional pathways that are involved in number of uh, behaviors. Um, for example, visual processing, uh, auditory processes, uh, uh, processing uh, some executive functions like decision making. Um, and uh, the focus for us was on sensory motor uh, pathways and frontoparietal pathways. And these are the ones that are involved with, your, with our speech production, sensory motor controlling, uh, specifically uh, processing of sensory information and the motor output, while uh, frontoparietal um, uh, pathways, uh, functional pathways are controlling our executive decisions. Uh, and sensory motor integration, integration of information from different regions that is necessary for cognitive aspects of our speech control. So uh, what Giovanni did, uh, first identified uh, networks, uh, the sensory motor and frontoparietal networks uh, that are common between uh, patients and healthy subjects. So we are not missing any networks in your brains. They're all there. They are just slightly different. So um, uh, these differences are um, quite important because as I show you, later on we um, uh, try to capitalize on this knowledge and use these uh, subtle, specific differences uh, between patients uh, with spasmodic dysphonia and healthy subjects in order to build our neural markers for diagnosis. Uh, so we further looked into uh, genotype effect and again we found that uh, while these are the same networks, same pathways that seem to be slightly different between patients and uh, healthy subjects, um, when you uh, break down patients into groups of familial and sporadic cases, as well as adductor and abductor cases, we have uh, very specific regions that are involved with each of these um, group of uh, individuals. So. Um, so uh, the outer functional connectivity varies based on SD genotype, though we don't know specific genotype, this is based on the family history of dystonia uh, and based on SD phenotype, meaning adductor versus adductor. So um, as a second step uh, um, in our explorations, we use uh, machine learning for objective diagnosis of spasmodic dysphonia and in one particular study that Giovanni did, we looked uh, into linear discriminant analysis, which makes predictions uh, by estimating the probability that a new set of uh, individual brain images um, or input belongs to a specific class. So for this, uh, we have basically a training data set and testing data set. We train our model on the uh, available data um, and um, based on specific abnormalities that we identified in a larger group of subjects. And then we start fitting new uh, uh, testing data sets where the question is now uh, for the algorithm to identify to which group uh, the new subject belongs. So, and by doing this, you can come up with a classification, something like this, um, separating two groups um, and making a decision about their, uh, where they belong. So, um, uh, as I said, uh, the accuracy of um, determining uh, diagnosis is really lacking clinically and um, it is as low as 34% uh, which is, um, in other words, 50% uh, is a level of a chance, it's flipping a coin at 50%, so uh, it may or may not be. Uh, SD, for example, and if we have agreement rate between physicians at 34%, it's pretty much no agreement rate, and you would agree with that. Um, so, um, using uh, not clinical symptoms, but using brain images and looking into specific brain abnormalities that distinguish specific class of patients, uh, we were able to diagnose uh, um, uh, spasmodic dysphonia, discriminate them, so-called, from uh, healthy subjects uh, at a 71% accuracy, which is quite different from being 34% uh, of agreement rate for uh, clinical evaluations. 
Uh, further on, uh, we um, looked into the accuracy of discrimination and our classification between sporadic and familial cases, and we had even higher accuracy of 81% here. So why is this important? Uh, it is because uh, now we are able to look into the um, you know, patients in a different way, and you know, some of the uh, sporadic cases ended up being in the familial group. And by the way, this is the decision boundary that separates two groups, the red line. Um, so for example, the so-called sporadic cases are, uh, it's an arbitrary uh, definition because we do not know a specific gene for spasmodic dysphonia and if the penetrance um, is uh, quite low, uh, as in any case of dystonia, then we really have um, we, we were basically guessing that it is sporadic and they don't have any underlying gene. Um, so, but these uh, uh, patients which are sporadic and classified as familial, um, uh, in close collaboration with Dr. Azilis, we now can look into them um, and see if there is a specific genetic mutation that may underlie their disorder. Uh, uh, clinic clinical challenge sometimes is to uh, distinguish doctor from doctor SD uh, and uh, we have, I guess it's not visible, oh well, no it's here, um, uh, with the accuracy of again of 71% we were able to uh, distinguish uh, these two groups. So, uh, and again, I want to stress out that this was not based on any of voice symptoms, no any objective or subjective measure. This was, um, uh, from voice uh, perspective, this was based on brain, uh, brain differences between the groups only. So, uh, just uh, to um, confirm that uh, it's not a dream, but something uh, real that we can really move it into more clinical applications. We use slightly different uh, machine learning algorithm uh, called support vector machines, um, which identified uh, and distinguished these groups uh, pretty much about the same accuracy. And this was all based on resting state fMRI. Uh, further on, just to look into the utility of imaging, we move to um, other um, imaging modalities, like for example, we used uh, uh, speech uh, fMRI during which uh, patients were producing sentences. They didn't like those sentences because they were breaking a lot. So, um, so we captured symptomatic um, voice production and again compared them to healthy subjects without symptoms. And again, uh, the algorithm derived um, pretty high accuracy um, uh, data in distinguishing uh, these uh, populations. As well as we looked into structural uh, changes, looking at the um, uh, cortical thickness, uh, and based again on the same principle of um, differences between the groups, we were again able to uh, identify um, same level of accuracy across different data sets and across different modalities. So the reason we did this uh, was first to confirm and replicate ourselves. Uh, we also did this to identify which of these modalities would be um, the, probably the shortest in time to acquire in, clinical, in a clinical setting and also uh, which uh, um, um, modality would be the easiest. For example, a speech production fMRI um, requires about 40 minutes of data acquisition. It has a lot of setup that is involved in the scanner uh, environment, um, while uh, resting state fMRI or um, uh, high resolution MRI for cortical thickness analysis, it takes really uh, about 10 to 15 minutes of scanning time and can be easily clinically translated. So, um, uh, just to conclude this uh, slide, uh, there are specific patterns of brain activity and uh, brain structural organization that may serve as ST diagnostic biomarkers of high accuracy. Um, oh, why there is a duplication? Yeah, so our next step, uh, oh, which is spearheaded by um, David Valeriani, who is here in the audience, 
is to uh, use this whole information to replicate this in a larger set of subjects. We have about uh, 300 uh, um, data sets from patients uh, with uh, spasmodic dysmonia and to develop a software tool uh, uh, for clinicians as well as for researchers. And uh, he's using not only uh, linear discriminant analysis, which was our first pass machine learning algorithm, but he's using more advanced um, machine learning algorithm, if you might have heard uh, recent, you know, uh, deep learning algorithm making use in different uh, biomedical applications. So we're building a system like that where uh, we um, you know, take imaging data um, and hopefully clinicians at some point can load the MRIs into the um, uh, classification software, have a software classify the disorder, have some uh, percentage of accuracy in distinguishing the uh, symptoms of disorder and have output that can not replace again physicians but to inform in their decision making because um, uh, SD is a complex disorder and there is much more than just looking uh, into the lens or just looking and listening to the voice or just looking into MRI. It's a complex disorder that requires input from different um, perspectives. So um, with that, I want to move to my second part of the talk about uh, uh, some uh, new therapeutic options that we have been developing over the years for treating spasmodic dysonia and voice tremor. And uh, Dr. Blitzer, who just walked in, uh, will talk about uh, this uh, in further detail. And uh, he has been a pioneer of uh, botulinum toxin use in uh, spasmodic dystonia, and that's probably pretty much what most of you are receiving, with uh, uh, some patients receiving more uh, benefits than others. Uh, but that's uh, pretty much a so-called gold standard uh, uh, treatment of spasmodic dystonia and other focal dystonias for that matter. Uh, botulinum toxin is injected into the affected laryngeal muscles. Uh, it usually um, has a period of side effects where you even can lose all your ability of you know, communicate uh, because of side effects. Um, uh, the effects last about uh, three, four months for, and you need to repeat this um, for the period of your life. So it is not FDA approved for spasmodic dysphonia, however it is approved for some other forms of dysphonia. There are no oral medications for SD, specifically designed for SD, um, uh, but some patients report anecdotal benefits uh, from some benzodiazepines and beta blockers and so on. Uh, these uh, medications are given on trial and error basis uh, uh, by clinicians and you know, in the, um, uh, in the scenario when we don't have any, um, any um, uh, oral uh, medication, we try whatever we can. Um, some patients also receive antidepressants and anti-anxiety drugs to cope with disorder associated depression and anxiety and many have been reporting some benefits just because it just uh, uh, improves uh, their mood overall. So um, in uh, starting uh, looking into the effects of sodium oxybate, we first conducted a study. Um, and the study was done by Diana Kirk, who is a neurologist at Mount Sinai currently. And you know, we uh, did an online survey where we selected 641 participants who completed a 21 questionnaire about their voice problems, treatment options, overall alcohol intake and effects other effects on voice symptoms. What we found is uh, that uh, about 56% uh, of patients, both with spasmodic dysphonia and uh, with um, you know, voice tremor, um, report uh, symptom improvement uh, um, after uh, about one to three drinks. Um, uh, <laughs> we did confirm this by asking if their friends and relatives also noticed the effect. And unless they were drinking together, uh, they did report that uh, yes, um, my relative or my friend did have an effect after drinking one uh, glass of wine, especially if you have tremor. Um, 
maybe two if you have SD. Uh, they also reported that the duration uh, of the benefit was about uh, one to three hours. So, um, alcohol, why it is, uh, uh, so in my career I heard um, from many patients saying over time that alcohol helps. First I was like, yeah, alcohol helps helps everyone, I guess. <laughs> but then I started realizing that I hear that more and more. So, uh, and I started thinking, well, maybe there is something there. So alcohol is known to modulate GABAergic function, and GABA is a, a main inhibitory neurotransmitter in the brain, which reduces neural activity. And uh, we know that activity in the brain uh, of a patient with spasmodic dysphonia is increased abnormally increased. We also know, based on the PET study, uh, with a specific uh, lichen that binds to these receptors, we know that GABA um, receptors are decreased, which is um, which leads to a loss of uh, GABA uh, transmission and loss of inhibition. So this mm, this um, uh, increased activity uh, stays uh, increased. It doesn't. Uh, reduced as we uh, for competing movement and uh, it plays a, a prominent role in the pathophysiology of dystonia in general. So at one of the meetings I met uh, Dr. Stephen Frum, some of you may have known him, uh, uh, and he talked about this drug sodium oxidate that uh, he uh, was uh, trying in patients with cervical dystonia and I asked him if um, uh, so, let me tell you what it is actually. Sodium oxybate is a gamma hydroxybutyric acid that mimics the effects of alcohol. So, um, it also, um, when ingested orally, um, sodium oxybate is quickly absorbed. It crosses a brain blood barrier, which is very important to us because uh, uh, that's how it can have a central effect on the nervous system and it converts into GABA within the brain, and the effect is very fast. So putting two things together, effect of alcohol and uh, decreased GABA uh, transmission, I um, asked him if we would try it in patients with spasmodic dysphonia, and he said he has been already talking to Dr. Blitzer uh, about this, and we said, okay, that's great, so let's look into that. And that's three of, well, what three of us uh, did in the course of several years afterwards, uh, the effect um, of sodium oxybate uh, is noticeable within 30-45 minutes in office and it lasts about three and a half and four hours. It may be good, it may be bad, it may be good because you, don't, you can take it as needed, you don't need to take it all the time over a continuous period of time to build the effect. Um, it's, it may not be good because you, maybe you want your uh, best voice for five, six hours rather than three and a half. So, but these are the sacrifices I guess we are willing to take. Um, what is important that alcohol um, leads to uh, dependency, as we know. The drug does not lead to dependency, so there are almost no reports of abuse or misuse of the drug. Um, voice after alcohol intake um, has rebound, uh, voice becomes worse. It does not after this drug. Uh, and the minor uh, side effects that we see are uh, largely dose dependent, and they may or may not include, not every patient has side effects, uh, they may include dizziness, sleepiness, or headache that also are resolved within uh, 40 to 60 minutes after intake. Sodium oxybate is FDA approved for um, cataplexy and excessive daytime sleepiness in narcolepsy. And uh, in our first pilot with three patients, uh, we decided not only to look into voice symptoms, but also to look at what it does to brain, because it's a central agent. So um, these are patients with spasmodic dysphonia compared to um, a healthy subject before treatment, and these are the same patients after treatment. What we saw, there was marked a uh, reduction of abnormally increased activity before treatment, and that uh, was captured about one hour after drug intake, and that was associated with their symptom reduction. 
So uh, we moved uh, further with treatment uh, uh, in an open label uh, fashion. We knew what we were giving to you and you knew what you are getting. Um, and we recruited 28 patients with spasmonic dysphonia and 22 patients with spasmonic dysphonia in voice tremor. And Anna Ramuk, who is a speech language pathologist in Australia, she has worked with us on evaluating all the symptoms um, and um, uh, giving us a blinded evaluations of voice samples as we were uh, first going through evaluation of voice and then further on down uh, into evaluation of brain images. So, um, uh, so they received, uh, patients received 1 to 1.5 gram uh, of sodium oxalate, which is a uh, oral solution. Um, and their symptoms were evaluated about 40 minutes after intake. And they were monitored for five hours within the next, um, uh, 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 with the next day follow up. What we found that patients uh, with uh, spasmodic dysphonia had marked reduction, a significant, statistically significant reduction of the number of voice breaks uh, per sentence. Uh, and this effect was seen in about 74% of patients with spasmodic dysphonia. And as I already said, uh, it was noticeable within 30, 40 minutes after intake and lasted about three and a half hours. Here is an example for you to judge. Can you please play the video? He is hiding behind the house. Hurry, Helen is far ahead. Hurry, Helen is far ahead. He has gone home because he is hungry. He has gone home because he is hungry. I have a friend whose home is a lighthouse. Um, so, um, this is his brain, a single subject brain, with brain activity. It will be more informative after I show you uh, what happens to brain activity after the drug. Can you play the second one? He's hiding behind the house. He's hiding behind the house. Hurry, Helen is far ahead. Hurry, Helen is far ahead. He is not home because he is hungry. He has gone home because he is hungry. I have a friend who's home with a lighthouse. I have a friend who's home with a lighthouse. And this is his brain after eating. So as you see, there is again quite a bit of reduction of brain activity, overly with brain activity. And if you might have noticed it, um, the, um, he struggled pretty much in uh, producing those sentences before the drug, and he was pretty much bored with us. <laughs> So moving on to um, spasmodic dysphonia with voice tremor, which is a problem with Botox injection. Voice tremor does not respond as well as, for example, a doctor ST. We found that it, um, it, uh, the drug resulted in reduction of not only of ST symptoms, but also voice tremor symptoms. And uh, Charlie's telling me I don't have time, much left, so I'll just uh, go a little faster. Um, can you please play? Tom wants to be in the army. Tom wants to be in the army. Are you going far from the farm? Are you going far from the farm? I want to put my doll in the cart. I want to put my doll in the cart. My father has a new car. My father has a new car. He is hiding behind the house. He is hiding behind the house. Hurry, Helen is far ahead. Hurry, Helen is far ahead. Um, <laughs> Tom wants to be in the army. Tom wants to be in the army. Are you going far from the farm? Are you going far from the farm? I want to put my doll in the car. I want to put my doll in the cart. Again, as you see, there is quite a My <coughs> father has a new car. My father has a new car. Okay. So just putting this all together, here, here are SD and SDBT patients compared to controls. And the regions in um, orange, is, red, orange, you see, are the regions that are normally increased in patients compared to controls. Um, and uh, this chart shows you in darker shading, 
increased activity and uh, in lighter shading, more normal, normal activity compared to healthy controls. And these are the same subjects um, compared to controls after drug intake. As you see out of these um, uh, larger regions that are overly active, there are only few regions that remain uh, somewhat active in patients versus controls. So um, this is a graphical representation. Uh, these are voice symptoms measured in patients who uh, do not respond to the drug compared to the ones who do respond to the drug. And putting this together in uh, green, you see the effect of the drug um, in responding to patients, uh, while uh, those who do not have respond are in um, purple. Uh, so the drug has widespread central effect and that's exactly what we wanted to achieve, to have something that is not only improving symptoms peripherally, but is also acting on its pathophysiology. And just to put this into perspective, uh, the dystonia and spasmodic dystonia pathophysiology is built on different, um, uh, on, on different factors. Uh, one of them is loss of inhibition, um, due to a uh, GABAergic um, uh, dysfunction, uh, and yeah, that leads to increased neural activity, which in, in addition to other genetic, environmental um, factors, uh, contributes to the manifestation of the stonic symptoms. So what we're trying to do, we're trying at least to um, normalize um, uh, the activity uh, of uh, GABAergic transmission, uh, which would lead to normalized activity uh, by using sodium oxidate that specifically functions on the GABAergic system. So um, just to conclude, sodium oxidate shows direct effect um, on the pathophysiology of spasmodic dystonia and voice tremor by acting upon normal neural activity within the dystonic network and the identification of an oral drug that selectively targets the pathophysiology of dystonia uh, I think is an important step forward uh, and toward better the clinical uh, management of dystonia in general. Thank you.